and the nomination of Dana S. Doyle to the position of Associate Justice of the Probate and Family Court. There's a letter from Governor Charles Baker. It says, I am pleased to nominate Dana S. Doyle to the position of Associate Justice of the Probate and Family Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to part two, chapter two of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Attorney Doyle? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. All right, and uh, you, you, I'm confirming you have three witnesses. Correct, they're all available by WebEx this morning. And are they with us? I see Ann Jeffrey on. Who, who are the other two? The other two is Francis Marinero and Leslie Curley. All right, we're going to start with uh, Judge Ann Jeffreyan, retired First Justice of the Hamden County Probate Court. Are you with us, Ann? I am. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Judge Hurley, Counselor Hurley, and fellow counselors. Um, it's my honor to have been asked by Attorney Doyle to speak on her behalf today. It's without hesitation that I wholeheartedly support her nomination for the position of Associate Justice of the Probate and Family Court. As a former judge, having served on the bench for 19 years, I can attest to the fact that being a judge in the Probate and Family Court is difficult, demanding, exhausting, while at the same time rewarding, fulfilling, and humbling. Attorney George was well prepared to meet the daily challenges of being such a judge. I first met Attorney Doyle when I was appointed to the Probate and Family Court in 1998. As a result of my appointment, I spent half the time between Hamden and Berkshire counties. Um, in my first year on the bench, I met a young attorney, Doyle, who tried her first contested case before me. Thereafter, I had the opportunity over the years to observe her handle a wide variety of matters. As a result, over the course of the years, we grew in our respective roles together. Hopefully over time, I became a better judge, but clearly over time, she became a better lawyer. Her nomination to the bench is well-deserved. She has always been well-prepared, articulate, patient, and well-versed in probate and family law. Since 1998, I have had the privilege of watching her grow into the seasoned attorney she has become. As a judge, it is important to work hard and ensure you're up to date on the current case law. That she is. However, it is even more important to have an attitude that is well suited for the bench. That attitude includes patience, compassion, and understanding, which I have qualities I assure you Attorney Doyle possesses. With an overwhelming caseload and insufficient resources, it is important that a judge maintain a calm but confident demeanor. Although a strong advocate, I never saw Attorney Doyle exhibit anger, impatience, disrespect in my courtroom to myself, to other lawyers, or to litigants. Many issues faced in the probate and family court have a profound impact on individuals, families, and children. Regardless of race, color, or creed, those decisions must be rendered without bias, prejudice, or favoritism, fairly and equitably. I am confident she will judge accordingly. For most non-lawyers, the courtroom is a daunting place. The balance for a judge is to get through a long list of cases while ensuring that all parties have an opportunity to be heard. Attorney Doyle learned quickly to present on behalf of clients in a concise, meaningful, and articulate way. She is clearly prepared to ha handle the demands of managing a courtroom in a timely, efficient, and fair manner. It's evident to me and to my former colleagues, lawyers, litigants, and court staff that she epitomizes what a judge of the probate and family court should be. Some 23 years later, I believe she has, been, I believe she has proven deserving 
of the nomination as Associate Justice of the Probate and Family Court. Thank you for your Thank time you. today. And I appreciate all your efforts in this process. Thank you. Are there any questions of Judge Jeffrey on? Anyone? Me. Marilyn. Marilyn. Um, Council thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Good to see you it's again. It's the beginning, but that's okay. Um, I, um, you know her for how many years? 23. Okay. So you know her her ups and downs, her personal life. Tell me, can you think of one adjective that you could describe one of her attributes that what she's going to be bringing to the bench? Compassionate. That's great. You know why? I say it over and over. People might be sick of me saying it. Um, the most important thing is compassion and empathy. And if a nominee doesn't have that, they don't have my vote. So. You said the right word. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Judge Jeffrey on? Anyone? All right. I have one. How's yeah. retirement? Retirement is great, but I've been doing some mediation trying to get through some of the backlog. Um, and uh, so, but they have to pay for that. They don't get it for free. Um, and Judge Casey is just um, starting a program with former judges to get through some uncontested divorces that we are volunteering to do across the state. So that begins um, in a couple of weeks where we'll each be taking. Yeah. Excellent. The, it, it was bad enough before, but the pandemic has now created a backlog that's unbelievable. So we're uh, we're volunteering for a few months, so one day a week. So that's good. All right. Well, it's great to see you, even if it's on remote. Yep. Uh, and I Thanks wish you the best in your retirement. Thank you. Uh, if if uh, Dana Doyle can be the kind of judge you were, we're all going to be better off for it. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Judge Hurley. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, our next witness is uh, Francis Marinero. Is he with us? I am, Judge. Thank you. Good morning, honorable members of the Governor's Council. My name is Fran Marinero, um, and it is also my pleasure that I speak to you today on behalf of Dana Doyle and her application to be appointed Associate Justice in the Probate and Family Court. Dana began her practice, as Judge Jeffrey and said, back in 1998 in the city of Pittsfield. That was about a year plus after I was elected Register of the Probate and Family Court. Um, therefore, I had the privilege of watching her develop as a young attorney, a uh, young woman who showed passion for the law and all those around it. Uh, the foundation for her success as a young practitioner was her preparation and her respect. Her respect for her clients, opposing attorneys, as well as their clients. You see, in the probate court, it isn't just about winning and losing, and Dana understood that. It was about families and everything that that represented, and life after the probate and family court. I remember when she had a, I remember early on in her career, she had a ferocious desire to learn, to understand the rules of the court, all the facets of the probate laws, along with programs that would be beneficial to not only the court, but more importantly to the people we served. Dana became a real friend of the probate and family court early on in her career. Understanding our staffing limitations and our large pro se population, Dana often became a generous supporter with her time, her expertise, and even her creativity. You see, the probate court didn't have a bag of revenue stream coming up the mass turnpike every time we wanted to create a new program programs that helped us deal with overburdened motion sessions or litigants struggling to navigate through a very difficult paper trail of, uh, in the system and also victims of domestic violence and so on and so forth as a long-standing chair of our bench bar committee 
Dana became intimately familiar with the operational needs of our court. Resources like legal education, otherwise known as lawyer for the day, found Dana as a regular volunteer since we created that program back in 1998. Dana was pivotal in the creation and the design of our conciliation program, a program that was very fond of by our judges, Judge Simons and, and, and some of the other judges, such as Judge Jeffrey, and that uh, frequented our court over the years. She single-handedly created divorce clinics to assist uh, young pro se litigants uh, that struggled to, as I said, to, to navigate through our, our difficult uh, system. Uh, she was a volunteer in a children's law project, project as well as the parent coordinator program. She was also uh, on the GAL list, and Dana never, never refused an impromptu request to play a part in, in assisting families uh, when we need an attorney for representation. In addition, Davis, Dana served our community well. She was an active member of city licensing board and other civic and nonprofit or organizations. So what will Dana bring to the bench? Aside from her 23 years of experience practicing in the probate court, Dana brings some things that are very, very important as I've watched over the years, as Judge Jeffrey pointed out so eloquently. Integrity, compassion for all those who will appear before her, an understanding of the law, along with a common sense approach. And I say that very, let me just say that again, a common sense approach to interpreting the law as well as a fierce work ethic. It is without reservation that I recommend Dana uh, as an associate justice of the probate and family court. Her demeanor, her, her compassion, and her hard work will certainly be a rewarding uh, effort uh, for the probate and family court as we go forward, as we, as, as we escape these difficult times. Uh, and I wish her well, and I wish you all uh, well as you decide this uh, task. Uh, a, a simple task, as I as I point out, that uh, I'm very uh, pleased that uh, Dana is being considered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fran Marinaro was the uh, Register of Probate for Berkshire uh, County and has served long and has served well. Uh, are there any questions of Mr. Marinaro? Yes, I do. Um, I do, Counselor. Counselor De uh, Devaney. Devaney, thank you. Devaney. <laughs> uh, so you've known the nominee for 23 years. That's correct. So um, could you tell us um, your working relationship and your working responsibilities that you shared in those years with the nominee? Yeah, I, as you may or may not be familiar with the probate court oftentimes as as even as judge jeffrey and pointed out we we struggle for resources to try to navigate through a very difficult system and dana was uh an active member of the berkshire bar she served as the president of the bar uh long-standing chairman of the domestic relations bar um and i know you asked about compassion compassion was a was a word that i also put down uh Counselor, and uh, but more importantly, her integrity and her preparation was something that was always struck me as very important as uh, as she uh, uh, attended case uh, uh, hearings in in the probate court. The the uh, she she never showed up uh, uh, to the courtroom without being well prepared and well versed on the issues that she needed to be well versed on uh, uh, representing her clients. But she was a friend to the court, and that was something that was very important to us as we as we try to uh, assist the community in limited with limited resources. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and it's good to have a witness that knows the nominee for 23 years, because I've said this before. I've been here a long time, and I can remember many times when I've asked a witness, you know, what, how she knows the nominee. One time in court, 
So you really, you really hit the mark. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions of this witness? I do, I do, Councillor Hurley. Councillor Jubinville. Uh, good morning. Uh, when did you retire? Well, I I stepped aside in January. How long did you serve up there? Twenty-four years, Councillor. Oh, God. Yeah, God love you. And 15 years with the Department of Social Services, now the Department of Children and Families. Well, you've deserved a re good retirement. Stay uh, healthy. Thank you. thank you for your service out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck to all of you. Any and other stay, questions? Stay safe. Any other questions? All right. Um, thanks very much, Fran. It's great to see you. And um, Mary, I hope good you to have see a you. great retirement. Thank you so much, Mary. Good to see you. All Thank right. you all. I believe um, we have all of the counselors um, with us at this time, so I would like to introduce them all, starting with uh, Councillor Ferrara, Councillor Marilyn, excuse me, Councillor Jubinville, Councillor Marilyn Petito Devani, um, Councillor. Um, Ayanella is going to join us by phone. Counselor yeah, Duff. Morning, oh, he's there. Okay. Good morning, Counselor Ayanella. Uh, Counselor Eileen Duff, Counselor Terrence Kennedy, Counselor DePaulo, and myself is uh, chairing this meeting, Mary Hurley. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Leslie Curley, a, a former uh, attorney who is retired from practice, uh, to speak on behalf of the nominee. Good morning. Um, morning. My name is Leslie Curley, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of Attorney Doyle. I'm coming to you from Florida this morning. Um, like Judge Would, Jeffrey, you, put, would oh, you put your video on, please? I, ah. How's that? Did it come up? Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, you're, yeah. you're cruel. Look at that background. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, anyway. Are those real palm trees? No, no, that's a virtual palm tree. Oh, that's very nice. Um, in any case, like uh, Judge Jeffrey and, and uh, Registrar Marinaro, I enthusiastically and without any reservation support uh, Attorney Doyle's nomination um, to Associate Justice. Uh, I have been a member of the, I was a member of the uh, Mass Bar for over 30 years, a member of the Berkshire County legal community for over 20, and I have known Attorney Doyle for almost 20 of those years. Um, I uh, was asked to um, substitute for her at legal aid in Berkshire County when she went on maternity leave. And we became friends. We were parents together. We were colleagues. We were adversaries and eventually became business partners in uh, a mediation firm. Um, I cannot stress enough the um, integrity, the work ethic, and most importantly to me, the temperament that uh, Dana has demonstrated over all of the years that I have known her. My late husband, Thomas uh, Curley, was a judge, and a, a superior court judge in Massachusetts. So I've been able to observe firsthand what temperament and what work ethic and it takes to sit on the bench. And, and particularly for Dana, she understands the dynamics of family law, which are in some ways much different than um, civil or even criminal law. And she is, not only does she have a, an enormous breadth of knowledge in family law, not only does she constantly upgrade her knowledge, um, but I think she is able to apply what she knows in a, in a compassionate way, in a way that always maintains the best interests 
of the children and the families that she serves. And I believe she will continue to do that as a judge. Um, so, as I say, I, without reservation, very enthusiastically uh, support her nomination. Um, and again, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak on her behalf. Thank you for speaking so eloquently. And I can um, speak to the fact that your husband, Tom, was a great judge. Um, and we miss him. Is there anyone who has questions of this witness? Thank you for your testimony. Anything else, Councilor Danny? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, you feel free to continue to stay on and watch the proceedings, or if you want to get out in the sunshine, go for it. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> now at this time, we will hear from the nominee. You may proceed, Attorney Doyle. Thank you. Um, if I may, I would just wanted to briefly introduce my family members who are here with me today. Um, I have my mother, Suzanne, my daughter, Chloe, my father, Evan, and my son, Peyton. And I'm very glad that they were able to physically be present here for today. Um, in light of the pandemic, it's, it's a nice exception that the governor's council is making, allowing some family members in here. So I think that's great. First, I would like to thank Lauren Green Petrino and the Judicial Nominating Commission. They've been incredibly helpful and supportive to me throughout this long and winding process that I believe is drawn out even a little bit longer because of the pandemic. Uh, I want to thank Valerie McCarthy, who is the Executive Secretary to this Council. She's assisted me with the administrative and the logistical preparations for today's hearing and answered all of my questions, and there have been many in the last couple of weeks. And she's responded promptly and um, didn't complain a bit. So I appreciate all of her efforts. I want to thank Bob Ross, the governor's legal counsel, for taking the time to meet with me and for recommending me to the lieutenant governor and governor. And thank you to Lieutenant Governor Polito and Governor Baker, who have put their faith in me by making this nomination today. I would like to give a special thanks to my counselor, Mary Hurley. She has given me encouragement, support, and invaluable guidance throughout this process. And I also like to thank each counselor who took the time to meet and speak with me. Um, all eight of you have taken time out of your busy schedules to talk to me, to give me encouragement. And again, some of you giving me guidance um, as to this process. It's helped to ease my mind because this is a very um, anxiety invoking process in some ways, and uh, you've made it a little bit easier for each person that again, took the time to talk to me. I appreciate it. Most of all, I need to thank my children who I just introduced because they have been with me um, through a lot of what you don't see in the process, the time filling out the application, the time away from them, um, trying to prepare for the hearing. And every interview that I had, they came with me and just sat outside and waited until I was done, which they did not have to do. Um, and as teenagers, you know, they probably didn't want to do but I appreciate the fact that they've been my cheerleaders and biggest supporters. And, uh, and again, I'm very grateful that my parents could be here. They traveled from Western New York. Um, thankfully, they've both been vaccinated so they could travel here without worrying about uh, the pandemic. And so the timing has been perfect in that, <clears throat> that scenario as well. So just uh, briefly a little bit about my family backgrounds. And I, I know that we, schedule, but my paternal grandfather was one of 10 children, he had a third grade education and quit school to work. But as an adult, he proudly served in the army in World War II. My own father served in the Air Force for four years after high school. He then put himself through college by working three jobs. He was the first in his family to go to college. And not only did he end up graduating with a four year degree, but he went on eventually obtaining both a master's degree in education and a certificate of advanced study in education. He became both a teacher and a principal in the small town that I grew up in. Uh, we only had one school district. There weren't uh, a whole lot of kids. So I, I did have a lot of interaction with my father um, on a personal basis, <laughs> again, both as a teacher and the principal. Uh, but what he taught me was the importance of education and hard work and where that could get you no matter where you come from. Uh, my mother's father was born to German immigrants. 
He never went to college either, but he worked hard in a family grocery store and was a father to five children. My mother was the first of those five children to attend college. She graduated with a degree in nursing, and she worked as a nurse at the only doctor's office that we had in our small town. Um, she did so uh, up until her retirement age and even beyond retirement, she was um, providing all of the skills and uh, energy that she could to people who needed it. She was very active in the church and she continues to be today. She spends a lot of time volunteering to help those in need and she fights for causes that she is passionate about. She may be little, but she's got a huge heart. And she has taught me the importance of putting others before yourself and helping those who are less fortunate. Both of my parents have taught me the value of getting to know people who are different from myself. They've encouraged me to have friends from different races, religions, and different countries. Uh, my father was thrilled that we were able to have a foreign exchange student come and live with us from Japan, because it was very important for us to learn and be exposed to people from different cultures. <clears throat> I think that in a way, my parents were ahead of the curve on this one. Together, they had four children. They adopted the first three children before I was born. Although my siblings were all adopted, I never viewed, as, uh, viewed them differently. My parents raised us to believe that family does not mean that you have to share the same DNA or blood type. It's the shared common experience that bonds us. When it was time for me to go to college, my father wanted me to be a teacher like he was. And that was the original plan. Uh, but as people who had kids go on to college, they don't always stay on the path that they originally chose, and they don't always become what you wanted them to be. And when I declared that I was going to be going to law school, I think that my dad was disappointed. He didn't know why anyone would want to be a lawyer. It's not by choice. Um, I think it was it was hard to understand, but perhaps uh, you know he he would adjust over time. Uh, I think that. Perhaps he was a little further disappointed or at least confused um, when I went to law school and decided that public interest was the path that I wanted to take. I was volunteering for Western Mass Legal Services as a second year, and as a third year, I was working in their clinical program as a 303 certified student. Based on that experience, I chose to enter the AmeriCorps program following my graduation from law school. For those of you who are not familiar with the AmeriCorps program, it is in effect um, more like volunteer service in much needed communities. Um, in my case, it was in the Pittsfield Office of Western Mass Legal Services, and the living stipend was approximately 15,000 per year. May have been a little less back then. I, I can't remember exactly, but um, it was a lot of work, very hard work for very little money. And I'm sure that my dad didn't understand that part either, as if you're gonna be a lawyer, why shouldn't you at least be able to pay your bills? <laughs> Um, but again, that's not why I went into that type of work. Um, it was for the reward, which is not financial in nature. So at Legal Services, I worked with both men and women who not only lacked financial resources to hire an attorney, but they often faced challenges such as mental and physical disabilities, substance abuse issues, cognitive deficiencies, and literacy or language barriers. I assisted these individuals with a variety of legal matters, including housing issues, unemployment, benefits, domestic violence, and family law issues. As I said earlier, not only is this work personally rewarding, but it also gave me the work uh, opportunity to work collaborative, collaboratively with community agencies in a variety of contexts. In 2002, after the birth of my first child, I was recruited by an attorney in a small private practice firm in Pittsfield. Keyburn Hollister managed to talk me into leaving legal services in order to join her in private practice. Anyone who has ever been involved with or met Key Hollister um, should know that she's very persuasive, and I don't regret that choice in any way. I was fortunate to work with John Goble and Key Hollister for approximately three and a half years before being recruited to work for Sanfloni and Sanfloni. It's also a small firm in Pittsfield. I stayed there for approximately seven years. The attorneys at both of these firms were not only mentors to me, but they also became my friends. They taught me how to hone my negotiation and litigation skills, and they forced me to step outside of my comfort zone by learning new areas of law, whether I liked it or not. Small practice firms, sometimes you have to take whatever comes in the door, and um, it is a, a learning curve, sometimes for better or for worse. 
But um, I think that was also a great way for me to be exposed to numerous areas of law that come in handy in ways that people don't realize in the probate court context. So under their guidance, I gained knowledge of the law in real estate matters, both residential and commercial, bankruptcy petitions, business and corporate law, discrimination and sexual harassment cases before the MCAD, personal injury cases, estate planning, guardianships of adults, civil commitment hearings in district court, elder protective cases. And in addition, I was have given the opportunity to work on several appellate cases, a class action suit, and a federal case in jury trial and superior court. I learned from them the importance of careful discovery, copious trial preparation, and extensive legal research. The attorneys that I worked with practice with integrity and professionalism, but they also emphasize community involvement and how it is, uh, how important it is to give back in any way that you can, whether it's by serving on boards, um, serving on the local bar association, or just volunteering in any capacity. I continue to do pro bono work, taking cases from the volunteer lawyer service panel every year, serving as a lawyer for the day to pro se litigants at the probate court, and volunteering as a lawyer for children. In 2009, after working on numerous personal injury cases, which were ultimately resolved in mediation, I recognized how important an effective mediator could be to a case. I was eager to become trained and certified as a divorce mediator so that I could utilize those skills in the probate and family law context. I participated in a multi-day training with experts in the field, such as Judge Edward Ginsburg. And that training taught me that problem solving and active listening skills can be used to de-escalate cases that involve powerful emotions and sometimes adversarial lawyers. Once I became trained as a mediator, I expanded my ADR skills through conciliation training and I also became certified to work as a GAL. I found that being able to look at a family law case holistically, as opposed to simply advocating for one side, was a welcome change. When my children were older, I wanted to be there for them more, so I started my own practice. This gave me the flexibility to be available for them, while at the same time it allowed me to do more of what I enjoyed, the non-adversarial work. My practice centered around family law, but I also worked as a GAL, a parenting coordinator, and as a divorce mediator. And I have to say, I enjoyed that time in my work immensely. After five years of being in private practice, uh, my office mate and friend, Leslie Curley, decided to retire early and head to Florida. And at that same time, a position opened up in the family law unit of community legal aid, formerly known as Western Mass Legal Services. It was my old job from 1998 in the same office with many of the same advocates that I have known for decades. In a way, I felt like it was fate. Once again, I found myself working for legal aid in the Pittsfield office in the family law unit. And I have no regrets. For the past four years, I've been helping those living at or below the poverty level try, to try and navigate this court system, which can be often overwhelming, confusing, and as we all know, stressful. I've discovered that this work is just important to me now as it was when I first started practicing back in 1997 as a volunteer. The volume of cases is still high, the needs of the clients are the same, but the passion for public service that I had before has somehow grown over the years. So no matter what happens going forward, I, I think that at this point, um, my parents are proud of what I've achieved. I think my dad can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, he's, he's very proud of where I'm at today even though I'm not a teacher. Um, so the question that comes up most frequently during this process is why do you want to become a judge? And I have to say that's one of the hardest questions for me to answer. I see myself as a public servant. I don't see myself as someone who um, would be sitting high in a bench in a robe. In some ways, having the stereotypes and the perceptions that people have of judges of um, not being able to understand or relate to their needs and what they're going through. Um, uh, because of that, you know, I, I think that it's been a struggle for me to acknowledge that perhaps um, this is something that it's okay to have a goal uh, to be a judge or to want to be a judge. Um, I felt that in some ways it was arrogant uh, to presume that perhaps I'm in the same caliber as these people that I appear before. And I just, I, I didn't see it in myself. So I have had the pleasure 
in Western Massachusetts of appearing before some very compassionate and empathetic judges over the past 20 years. And I think that these judges are very different. I first appeared before Judge Edward LaPointe back in 1998. He was the first justice of the Berkshire Probate and Family Court. I was young and I was nervous and new to the area. And I was fearful that I would not be treated with the same level of respect as my older colleagues. But Judge LaPointe was kind and patient and he immediately made me feel at ease. He even made sure that he pronounced my maiden name correctly, which was not easy for people. I thought that his temperament was perfect for the position that he held, and he cared about the people who came before him both professionally and personally and treated the court staff like friends and family. I tried many cases before him over the years, and I always felt that my clients were treated with respect and compassion. I've also been fortunate enough to appear before numerous other judges who have the same qualities, but perhaps slightly different styles. Judge Ann Jeffreyon was a role model for me as a female judge, both professionally and personally. As she mentioned, I tried my first multi-day custody slash removal trial in front of her back in 1998. I could see then that she was fair yet firm when needed. And I really looked up to her and hoped that I could <coughs> aspire to where she was at some point in my lifetime. In 2010, Judge Richard Simons took the job as the new first justice of the Berkshire Probate Court. Judge Simons took me aside one day and encouraged me to apply for a judicial vacancy. And as I've stated, even though I could not see it within myself at the time, he thought that I had what it takes to do this job. Judge Simons, in my opinion, is one of the most, if not the most, empathetic and sensitive probate court judges in the Commonwealth right now. And I remember thinking that he was just being nice to me at the time because he was such a nice guy. Approximately 10 years later in 2019, another vacancy opened up. And at that point, a few more Western Mass judges, again, people I greatly admire, reached out to me and encouraged me to apply. This time it wasn't just Judge Simons, but other people believed in me as well. So although it's still a little uncomfortable to say it out loud, I do believe that I am prepared to meet the challenges of this job based on the experience that I have. Over the past 24 years, I've represented people from every walk of life and all economic classes. I've represented mothers, fathers, grandparents, children, guardians, conservators, elders who've been abused, adults who are mentally incapacitated, de facto parents, veterans, same-sex couples, people with disabilities and substance abuse issues. In the probate and family law context, I've handled prenuptial agreements, divorces, post-divorce issues such as quadros, removal cases, name changes, paternity cases, guardianships, conservatorships, estates, equity complaints, adoptions, receiverships, restraining orders, petitions to partition, and elder abuse cases which I believe probably spreads the entire gamut of what could come before a probate and family court judge on a daily basis. <laughs> I believe the wide variety of cases coupled with the diverse client population that I've served has given me a unique perspective and a broad understanding of the myriad of issues that can come before the probate and family court. And I also believe in timing. I feel the time is right at this point in my life to continue on my path of being a public servant and if you approve this nomination, I would be honored to serve the Commonwealth as an associate justice of the probate and family court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After that presentation, I can't imagine any one of the counselors having any questions. However, I'm going to call on Council Ionella. Do you have Thank any questions, you sir? I agree with you. After that presentation, who could have a question? Um, I don't have a question. I had a lengthy conversation with attorney Doyle uh, and she answered all my questions. Uh, I want her to know that I was very impressed with the people who spoke on her behalf today and obviously very impressed with her presentation. I did get a call from a uh, former uh, judge of the uh, probate and family call uh, court, Edward Ginsburg, who I have the highest regard for. He speaks uh, volumes and uh, he's so, uh, excited to hear that uh, Attorney Doyle uh, will soon be on the bench. I don't have any questions, uh, but <clears throat> Attorney uh, Doyle, you should know that, uh, as, as you probably know, uh, Councillor Hurley contacted many counselors. She contacted me and is a strong supporter of yours, 
And when your name comes before the council next week, I'll be more than happy to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ionella. Councillor Ferrara. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I concur with uh, you and Councillor Ionella that, uh, you know, it's hard to think of any questions. Um, I did have the opportunity to speak with the nominee last week. Um, I was uh, extremely impressed. Uh, I am further impressed by the fact that you, uh, Councillor Hurley, are a huge fan and you know her, um, you know her, her intellect, you know her demeanor, and you know what it takes to be a judge in the probate court. And um, I do not know all those things, but uh, we certainly agreed on shared parenting and things like that. I think she's going to make a superb judge. Um, and I want to thank you for your service, um, for all the things you've done and helping needy people throughout the years. And uh, you certainly have my vote and support next week. Thank you. Thank you. And I would let everyone know that every day I was on the bench, I thanked God I wasn't in the probate court. I hear Just you. Having to handle the restraining orders was enough to really um, tell me that I, I was lucky to be where I was. Um, any other questions, Councillor Duff? Done you. myself. Can you, make, you. can you hear me? Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for applying, Attorney Doyle. I, as I shared with you, I found your um, application really refreshing to read. Um, you touched on a lot of issues that are incredibly important to me. And um, I, I think you're very well suited for this court. I'd also like to say, I think it's really wonderful. Um, you have a nice balance. You've worked in private practice, but your dedication to the public is really um, exemplary. And um, and I really want to thank you for that. I will ask you one question. Um, what do you what do you, do you have any anticipation of what you think your biggest challenge will be when you uh, if you ascend to the bench and sit? I think the biggest challenge coming out of this pandemic is going to be the backlog. To start off with, and then the continued challenge of trying to hear all of these cases in a way that gives everyone a fair opportunity to be heard, meaning uh, we still have a lot of Zoom hearings happening. I don't know when we'll be back to normal in terms of having full in person hearings. Uh, so I think that there are going to be challenges in terms of trying to make your way through the backlog in a way that allows everyone's cases to be appropriately heard. Um, and you may or may not have had time to think about this, but there is some thought that um, we should continue to employ some of the technology, such we call everything Zoom. It's not always Zoom, but it's like Kleenex. WebEx. Uh, WebEx, right. They're, they're much more secure systems we're on than Zoom. Um, <coughs> but um, would you be open to... Um, uh, employing some of these technologies uh, in certain cases to do exactly what you just said, streamline the process and help move the docket along. Um, absolutely. I think that what we see going forward is that Zoom is not going to go away in terms of the technology that we have. And in the probate court context, I can't speak for the other courts, it's actually helped to improve the efficiency where at one time in a busy motion session, you would have parties and council having to wait around for hours all morning, sometimes the entire day coming back after a lunch break to be heard for 10 minutes. Whereas for that same type of non evidentiary hearing, mm -hmm. they could have a set time that they can log in from wherever they are. So we, we can help improve the efficiency in terms of having things dealt with in a more timely manner. We don't have people losing time from work having to deal with childcare issues. I think it's gonna be a great benefit to the public for us to keep using this. Thank you, I, I concur. I, I've spoken to people, not just on the bench and working in the courts, but also people who've appeared in court. And in, in, uh, they've said that it's really, for some of them, been very, very beneficial for the reasons you just cited, that they don't have to take an entire day off. Um, you know, if they have a smartphone or they have access to a computer, um, they can appear. And to me, that increases access to justice. And that is part of our charge here is to create 
uh, the the fairest playing field that we can. So I'm pleased to hear uh, your thoughts on that. It's simply because I agree with them, but I think they I I think that's the direction we're headed in. Um, thank you so much, and thank you again for your application. It, it was quite refreshing to see someone who has really dedicated their life. Um, to public service want to continue in that path. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And I, I must say, as an uh, attorney who went back into practice in the probate court, the, the idea of <clears throat> having a set time uh, where you have to appear um, came to me very often in the frustration of sitting there from 9.30 or 10 o'clock um, till 12.30 when I finally got hurt. So I think that's a great idea. Um, anyone, let's see, um, Councilor DiPaolo, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank, thank you, Councilor Hurley. Uh, Attorney Doyle, we had a chance to talk and you had a thorough presentation. I did wanna uh, expand on something Councilor Duff was just talking about and that's access to justice. Um, you and I had discussed mental health issues um, that could potentially create barriers for folks. Um, but also um, the changing demographic in the Pittsfield area, you know, that's been ongoing and issues around uh, language barriers. And I wonder if you could just talk about uh, what you see happening in Pittsfield and how you would be um, addressing that as a judge. Um, so I don't think the issue is just in Pittsfield. I think that this is being seen throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but when it comes to non-English speaking litigants having access to justice, I mean, the first thing we wanna look at is the interpreters and whether they have access either by telephone or in person to qualified interpreters in their particular language. I can say that again, because of Zoom and one of the benefits to COVID, um, whereas before we may have had someone um, who does not necessarily speak one of the more common languages uh, out in Pittsfield would have had to wait for someone from Boston to travel out for a court hearing. Uh, that's not only hard on the interpreter who's had to spend the entire day in a car to show up to court for one hearing, but it's also hard on the people having to wait. And with the benefit of Zoom, we now can have interpreters sign in for the hearing and provide assistance uh, virtually for lack of a better term. There's um, this is probably for another day, but there's some I think we talked about the very cool technology that Zoom has now where they can actually you can change your language channel on the Zoom hearing so that if you have a non English speaking. Participant, they can switch to the language that they speak. So they're only hearing that the interpreter is only hearing that and the other parties and the judge are hearing the English channel. So I do think technology has helped to improve it a lot uh, going forward. I think it's very important, I just think, for the office in Boston to um, be aware of certain populations that are growing and the need for different languages and interpreters, and either through recruiting and training, just to make sure we have more bodies and more people available to do this type of work. I appreciate uh, your sensitivity to that and the other issues around access to justice. We also had a chance to talk about the probate and family court, and you alluded to this in your comments. Um, looking, making sure that we're looking after the best interests of the children and not necessarily the best interests of the adults because they don't always align. Um, with the comments you've had today uh, and your background with legal aid and listening to you uh, and hearing someone who's committed um, to her clients, um, who has a lot of compassion uh, and who has uh, humility. And I think that's such an amazing profile to have on the bench. And I'm so glad that you did decide to see yourself as a judge and apply because um, Lots of folks who fit your profile don't necessarily apply and don't necessarily take that step to see themselves as a judge. So I'm very excited to um, to see your application today and I look forward to supporting you uh, when our assembly comes. Thank you very much, Councillor DiPaolo. Uh, Councillor Juvenville. Thank you, you Councillor Hartley. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to tell you that I, I think you're a wonderful candidate. You have everything that I look for in a candidate. Thank Worked you. a long time in the uh, probate court, so you know what, what it takes to be a lawyer and to make money and pay the bills. Uh, uh, I, I think you're a fantastic candidate. So I'm going to be proud to vote for you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hurley. Thank you Thank very you. much, Councilor Jubinville. Councilor Devaney. 
Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, I want to thank you again for, you know, coming that distance, but I'm sorry to tell you that Judge Island beat you coming from his area <laughs> to meet me. But um, first of all, I, I just want to say that um, this is such a wonderful time for you this day to have your parents and your children here. That That's wonderful. And in person. Thank you. Um, th that is special, you know, very special. And they're very proud of you and talking with you for, I don't know, I think we closed the place after four and a half hours. Um, I know that you're so proud of them. Um, what I always like to ask is your journey here, how you reached here. So um, you applied when you were 37 years old. Did you think that you were ready? Did you think you had all the life experience and legal experience to take this on? I think if you're referring to back in 2010, um, that is the time when Judge Simons had taken me aside and encouraged me to at least participate in this process, meaning um, be familiar with the application, be familiar with the interview process, that this is something that um, takes some endurance to get through. And so back in 2010, I don't know that realistically, I thought that I had enough experience to be a judge at that time. But I will also say that I got surprisingly far in that process, um, probably more of a surprise um, to myself than, again, with the little experience, let's say, that I had in the age that I was at the time. I did receive an interview at the JNC, and I did receive the vote out into due diligence at that time. Um, so that was very exciting for me. But to answer your question, realistically, I think that I'm in a much better position now. Uh, I think they, you had two no's here. I don't know. That must have been a mistake. But um, and then you applied in, uh, you know, four years later. Um, so looking back to this day, what have you, what more have you brought with your experience and your life experience that you've learned in reality um, probably wasn't the right time? Um. So I just think the longer you practice, the more cases that you have, the more things that you're exposed to, uh, it, it's it's going to give you a professionally more experience. But personally, I can also say that uh, perhaps in a much better place right now as far as my children and their ages, because I felt like at the time they had a, a certain window where I wanted to be there all the time for them for everything. And now they're finally Heading out in the other direction, and I can give my full focus 100% um, to my career. Well, say we 90, 95% while still focusing on. Right. No, I understand. Um, first of all, I do want to tell you that I, I had a wonderful phone call from uh, retired Judge Ginsburg. I love him. He's and I. We had a long conversation, and um, he just thinks that. You know, this is the best appointment and he thinks the world of you. It was a very nice conversation. So let's go back to um, this time when you applied and you went before the JNC. Now, um, I talk about compassion and empathy and those are very important to me because no one should sit on that bench if they don't have those two qualities. You have it. So um, tell me um, what happened and um, when you went there and about how many people were there and, and tell me how it went. So my initial interview with the JNC, I believe was in early July. And at that time we were just coming out of the pandemic. So instead of having um, what I would presume is a full in-person interview, uh, the only people who were physically present in person was the chair of the JNC, as well as um, I believe Lauren Green Petrino was also present. And then uh, the rest of the members were on Zoom. So they were asking me questions remotely as we are doing today. So how many people ask questions? You said, I mean, I'm talking about the yeah, commission. Yeah. Everyone who was on the call asked a question um, as far as the exact number of members who were on the call. Um, I would be guessing to say around 12. I, I'm not exactly sure. 
Okay, I'm going to ask you. The chair was there, Mr. Dacia. Correct. What did he ask you? His very first question was about empathy. Uh, I'm smiling because you know why. Um, he knows that that is number one for me, empathy. And all the nominees tell me the first question he asks is, "Give me a definition of empathy." So um, that's kind of nice for me that he's following in my footsteps. Um, so. Um, I do want to say it's so refreshing, no political contributions. Okay. So, having said that, um, I wanted to ask you uh, well, first of all, I want to get into it, shows your caring, it shows your compassion, some of the things that you have established that you've initiated. Um, and before I get to that, I wanted to just talk about. Well, one of your cases was, um, you know, just caught my eye, and that was the one where the woman was her uh, trying to get her mother's money, but there was no body. Would you want to talk about that? That was a unique case that had been referred to me from the district attorney's office. Uh, they became involved because they were investigating at the time a missing person. The woman um, in question was reported missing. The police and the DA's office through their investigation uh, suspected the husband had been involved and that perhaps there was some foul play. But at that point, they didn't have um, a body, so they couldn't prove whether or not she was still alive. She was simply a missing person. The husband then committed suicide, and um, the police and the DA's office, uh, understandably, were a little bit frustrated not being able to get any answers and, and go further with their investigation. And the woman's daughter was referred to us because she was concerned that all of the property that her mother had, which may not have been a lot, but it was all that she had left of her mother, was um, located in the house that she had lived with her husband in. And according to the laws, she was concerned that all of her mother's property um, was perhaps going to go to the husband's family and she needed some protection. So I assisted her with a receivership case, which is a little bit unique, um, absentee petitions and, and even the court. This is something we all had to work collaboratively, collaboratively on to do some research to figure out how it should be done because it's not often used. Um, so it was a little bit unique from a legal perspective, but um, from the daughter's perspective, I think it gave her that peace of mind that somebody was working on her behalf to protect her mother's things. Eventually, about a year later, the body of her mother was found. Um, she had been murdered. And now that we had a death certificate, um, she could officially move on with the case and no longer the property was in receivership, but she could then um, take it and either sell it or keep it for herself. So it's not something that you would see in the probate court every day. But it's just an example of a unique situation where we had to come up with a creative solution to a very sad set of facts. Uh, I'm concerned about 209A's restraining orders. Are you doing those Zoom? Um, during the pandemic, I've had restraining order hearings both by telephone and by Zoom. Well, uh, you know, my personal opinion, I don't think that. I guess you have to do it. Those are, you know, immediate problems, but just doesn't seem right to me. You have to look someone in the eye. You have to look at the body language and you don't get that. I, I don't know how you can even judge that or determine. And the one thing I always am concerned about, even in person, how to determine if that person who was accusing the other party is being truthful? How, how do you judge? Uh, <laughs> well, Prior to this, I didn't have to deal with that issue. Um, I think in this position, listening becomes key. Ideally, when you're in person, you can look at someone's body language. Uh, if you don't have the benefit of evidence or other witnesses, those are the toughest cases. Um, obviously, if you have something like a text message or an email that's threatening or that supports um, the statement that's being given to you, that is the best case scenario. I think what we see more often are the he said, she said cases, and you really are trying to determine who's telling the truth. And you just have to do your best to make your own assessments, um, hope that it's right, 
and follow the law. You know, this pandemic is affecting so much in crime, especially. Um, I'm very concerned about child abuse and most especially in this pandemic um, in the children and family service. Only 46% have gone out in person to the homes since since January. And in January, the social workers all got their vaccine. I'm concerned about that because we hear about just recently there was a boy that um, I think he was an autistic child and he had a bruise on his face and there was a social worker that went out and the mother said oh he did that himself and she dismissed it well he later died he later was abused and died so I'm just saying that what can be done we there's so much going on and I understand the pandemic but how do we reach those children because before the pandemic a child could go to school and if he had a bruise in his face or if he was acting not he was acting out of the ordinary the teacher would sense it or he maybe he would talk to the teacher don't have that anymore babies they're being killed all the time I hate to read the paper I, I don't know what we can do but is there something more I'm not a fan of the family and children okay it disturbs me when they close the book on someone and say oh they're doing the best they can and then you find baby Bella in a bag thrown in the water you know that that's disturbing so um Having said that, I, I'm I'm glad you have a lot of good background, and most especially in these days, mental health and substance abuse. Can you tell me some of the some of the victories and some of the failures that you've had? You you know that you've been so proud of, and some you've been disappointed in. Um, relative to substance abuse mm -hmm. and mental health issues. Um, there, those are long and difficult cases. We don't usually get a result quickly um, that everybody's happy with. I think that the most rewarding cases are ones where you can see your client or the person who is suffering from those issues uh, making progress over time. And that could be that they have found the right counselor and the right support and are on the right medication. Or that um, as far as their substance abuse, perhaps they... Um, have been in recovery for a significant period of time without a relapse. So sometimes it's a baby steps. It's not looking for a cure to any of these problems. It's just knowing that they've made progress on their own, that they're continuing to work hard every day, and that their children are going to benefit from that. Well, um, I want to give you the opportunity to tell us because I, I just think it's, it's wonderful that you have gone beyond, and there, it's when the compassion and empathy comes in. And, um, you know, when, when you were asked, um, when you asked, um, you know, additional information, you know, something that you are most proud of, I thought that it was really great and it didn't take overnight in your initiative. And if you could tell us about the Massachusetts Bar Foundation grant um, in, to form the Berkshire County Children's Law Project, um, and uh, the well, there was three things that you have done, but I think the one that you know, and it's all for children for the Mass Bar Foundation grant to represent children um, in the court. And um, there's so many that are, you know, that can't afford a lawyer. And uh, I think that you saw that, and I think that's why, you know, you felt in your hat you had to do something. So there was three initiatives that you put forward. So um, the first one, is I was especially, um, you know, I, I especially thought that was great. So if you want to tell us about those. So the um, Children's Law Grants, we'll call it, 
I was trying to find a solution to the problem of we were one of the only courts in Massachusetts that didn't have a program in which attorneys could be appointed as children, or I'm sorry, appointed to represent children in probate and family court. A lot of the other counties had it based on just the resources that they had available. Um, and we found also that we ask our lawyers who are in private practice to volunteer in a lot of different ways to give us their time um, pro bono, being lawyer for the day, taking on cases for little or no pay to um, assist people. And the Mass Bar Foundation allows for certain programs to get some startup money in a way that we thought this would be a great fit. We can get these children attorneys, but we can also give these lawyers a little bit of money uh, while doing it, knowing they're taking so much time out of their schedule to put into these cases. Um, it wasn't a lot of money, but they would get paid something. And so the Mass Bar Foundation grant that we were able to apply and receive helped to defund the program um, at least, I can't remember exactly how many years that it went forward, but uh, it was fairly successful. It was something I think that was much needed. Um, at this point, we just have people who are still just volunteering and not getting paid to represent these children because it's such important work. I think it's very rewarding work as well. Right. Well, you should be proud of that. I that that's impressive. But you know, I, I just feel that, you know, um, you have gone beyond your position to see what was wrong and to see how you could fix it, make it better. And um, I've been here a long time and I am very impressed. I'm very impressed with what you've done. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about meeting with you and, and finding out about your family. And they certainly have um, made, a, made a difference in your life and, and inspired you that you could do this. And, and um, I'm very, happy to see you on the bench. We need people like you. You know, um, you did it the old fashioned way. Not three pages of contributions, not all relatives on the bench. You did it the old fashioned way. You earned it. You're, you're so qualified, you're experienced, and um, you got a you got a hat. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you again for all the time you afforded me. I really and I've got to say, I always feel guilty when I have someone come that distance. And I just hope that you did have time with your son because you took the you took the uh, curse off me. <laughs> he's, he's wearing his new outfit. You did. So. OK, great. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Danny. Uh, Councillor Kennedy, last but certainly not least. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we spoke on the phone and I appreciated your time. Um, I think the probate court is a train wreck. Uh, with the exception of perhaps Council Juvenile, I'm the one who spends the most time in court, which means I get the most complaints about judges because of what I do. I've been doing it for about 11 years, so I voted on a lot of judges. Most of them I get good reviews on. The ones I get bad reviews and some really bad ones on are in the probate court. Um, are you familiar with what a bill of address is? I can't say that I am off the top of my head. A bill of address is a bill filed in the legislature to remove a judge from office or a public official from office. It goes through the, 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 the legislature in the same manner as any bill that would go through. Uh, it's there's two ways to remove a judge, judge either impeachment or a bill of address. About two weeks ago, a bill of address was filed in the legislature against a probate judge. Um, there were a number of litigants who appeared in front of her who petitioned the state rep from that area to file a bill because of the bias that that judge had shown against litigants right from the outset and the demeanor. Uh, of that particular judge. Uh, have you been in front of probate judges like that? Um, I would say that I've had the pleasure in Western Mass of being in front of some very good, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, empathetic, caring, compassionate judges. Okay, have you been in front of any lucky. bad ones? I have in court. I can say at the beginning of my career, um, perhaps there were some that did not have as, as much in terms of patience 
And um, you're being very, very polite. I'm trying. I'm not talking about patience. I'm talking about bias towards one litigant or another. Have you been in front of judges that you felt just simply weren't fair and had a bias for one side or other? Might be a pro pro mother bias, pro father bias, or in a particular case where they clearly showed a bias against one side or another. I wouldn't say bias. I think I was referring more to temperament. Mm -hmm. Okay. The biggest complaints I get are the probate judges in the probate court, and I get a lot of them. Okay. Some of the people I know and respect that, that I, I voted for. Um, the biggest complaint I get is the manner in which trials occur. And by the way, how many trials have you done from beginning to end? Say between um, 20, 30, but I will, with a caveat to that, say that in the probate court context, we have uh, numerous evidentiary hearings on a regular basis for contempts. Uh, I'm aware of that. And they are almost like mini trials, but as far as full complete trials to answer your question, between 20 and 30. Were they divorce trials? Yes. Okay. Um, now, the biggest complaint I get about divorce trials, especially, is the length of time that they take. And I bring this up with almost every probate nominee that comes here. Uh, and it falls on debt fears because they go and do the same thing. Um, and I sat down with somebody last week who just got his decision on a divorce. I'm going to talk to you about that. He has to sit down with me in a few minutes. But um, they start a trial September 1st. They go three or four hours. Okay, we I have other work to do. We have to continue this. Come back on December 15th. They come back on December 15th, they go a couple of more hours or the case gets continued because the judge isn't available. They come back February 15th. Come back to a few more hours, they come back May 15th. Is that the way they operate out in Western Mass? Because that's how they seem to operate here. That can happen. Okay. Uh, Why? There's not a single good reason that when a case starts that it can't go from beginning to end with that judge one day after the other can you think of a single reason so i think what um sometimes happens is there's a poor estimate that's been made by the attorneys and the judges at the pretrial stage okay but, 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 long but, going to take. But, but you've been around a long time the judges have been around around a long time you can figure that out they figure it out i i do mostly criminal work and some civil and when we start a trial we finish it and if there's other matters on they wait. Why is the probate court different? I don't disagree with you. Um, I think that. Well, what are you going to do about that? When you ask, you're going to sit on the bench. Everybody already said they're voting for you. I am too. But what are you going to do when you are on the bench about situations like that? Uh, from what I've seen, I think some things that I could do differently in terms of time management, making sure that these trials start on time, first of all not accepting lawyers who come in at nine o'clock in the morning ready to start a case saying that they need more time to talk out in the hall to see if they can resolve things and instead forcing that trial to start and move things forward and not wasting the precious time that was given for this trial because to answer your question about delay i think a lot of times that's what happens is that if things well, i understand starting, people try to settle things that happens in civil cases it happens in criminal cases correct and but that, perhaps they should have tried to settle things the night before but, and not on the court's time but sometimes that's because you need to be at a trial date to settle that. You know that. You've been there. You know, sometimes it's a, that's the way you get a client to settle as you're about to start a trial, right? Right. Okay. It's not always it the lawyers. Hours. Sometimes that's when the lawyers can get the clients to do what they think is a fair thing, right? Right. So, I mean, so you can calculate that into your time. You can say, okay, we're putting this on at nine. We're probably not going to start till 10. We'll do a couple of other things first. But once you start it, once that trial starts, why? How long does the average divorce trial take? Not a complicated one with, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan type people there. Just a simple divorce. If it was just the parties and no other witnesses, it could take a few hours. Okay. So why can't you finish it? I think in those cases you can. Okay. What about cases where there are children involved and they're fighting over custody and visitation? You're looking at least parenting time. I'm sorry. I'm an old school guy. Well, and again, depending on whether you have a GAL involved and how many witnesses you're talking at, at the minimum one day. Minimum of what? Minimum one day. Okay. So let's say it's three days. Why can't you finish it? 
You Those, should be able to finish it. I think it's also trying to get the consecutive days. But it does, why well you plan that? Correct. That's not what happens anywhere that I've seen in the probate court. Do you see it? Um, I've actually experienced the same frustration that you said, which is having a trial it, start one it, day and a month it, later having to finish it. It creates a lot of stress for the parties. It creates a situation that is not good for the children in cases involving custody and visitation. Um, it creates an issue with the judge because you might be sitting here today looking at me and judging my character, judging my credibility and all other kinds of things, taking mental notes. Four months from now, I show up after you've done 2000 cases, you're scratching your head and looking at your notes. You know what I mean? I agree. You don't even remember me. And all of a sudden you, you and this is another complaint they get. They seem, the judges seem to be siding with one side and they come back and they've done a 180 when they come back for no apparent reason. Do you see that? You're nodding your head. Yes. What would you do in court? You're going to let the witnesses nod their head? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I said yes, and it just perhaps didn't carry through the microphone. All right. Anyway, the, um, I, uh, a, a, dis, a dissatisfied person on a divorce called me up the other day, and I know him very well. He asked me to take a look at it. I don't do divorce work. I never do divorce work, I, and I never will. I'm with Counselor Hurley. I'd rather gouge my eyes out than go into probate court. Um, he got a decision. That trial took almost 18 months to finish because it was broken up like that. The judge seemed to do those flip-flops that we talked about. He wasn't happy with the decision. Um, one of the reasons was that uh, the judge didn't credit one of his witnesses that I know as well, that I consider extremely credible. And I'm not gonna tell you who that is now, but I'm gonna tell you who it is when we end this, okay? And um, uh, believed his wife about a situation that happened despite the fact it was a witness um, and gave full legal and physical custody to the wife because they couldn't communicate, the husband and wife. Tell me the circumstances where a person should lose full legal custody. Who's meaning that they had it? Given it all to the wife, legal and physical. They had it during the, they obviously had it when they were married. They had, had it during the pendency of the divorce and now none. There's no situation where there's allegations of abuse. There's no situation where there's allegations of abuse dealing the, with the children. But husband and wife can't communicate. When should that happen? Before you said abuse, that. That is the scenario that I it's was not here. thinking of because in the cases it's, where there's not here. where there's no ability to communicate legally with yeah. each other. But when you take away legal custody from the father, you're basically saying he can't talk to the schools, he can't talk to the doctors, he can't participate in medical decisions for his young children, he can't participate in educational decisions, religious decisions, right? That's what it means. Correct. It's the death penalty. Right? Yes. Well, from a perspective of, of not feeling fully involved in your children's lives. In yes. terms of a divorce, it's the death penalty. When should that happen? Well, I go back to my answer about the abuse. I not there. I, so should I it ever happen if there's no issue of abuse where it's just an issue of communication? So I can't answer the question as to your particular case that you're discussing. I don't know why that happened. Okay. Forget about that case. In what circumstances would you take legal custody away from one parent or the other? Other than abuse? Other than abuse. There's not there. No allegation of it. No drugs. No abuse. I think there sometimes are circumstances where the parents have such opposite views when it comes to, say, religion that it does make it um, very hard for them to make certain decisions together. 
I don't see that as necessarily a communication issue, but just that they are at polar opposites in terms of the way that they may view how the children should be raised. Usually the reason people get divorced is because they're not communicating very well. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes. That's a big part of it, right? Yes. Okay. So we start from the premise that there's a communication problem. They're going to a div divorce. Some people you would agree going to a divorce can communicate fairly well, uh, especially about their children. Others can't communicate at all, right? Correct. So mom and dad don't talk to each other. Um, when they do, they just argue. They disparage each other to other people. Should that ever affect if a, if a father has a loving, good relationship with their children, the, the legal custody? Maybe physical, but legal? Okay, now you've done approximately 20 divorce trials. I noted that you did some guardianships and some probate as well. Correct. That's good because we don't get many people here that have done that. Uh, have you done some full estates? Um, when I worked in, in private practice, we had, as a result of doing a number of, of wills and um, trusts for people over the years, when they passed away, we then had to deal with the estates. Um, most of those were uncontested. It was yeah, just a I was just going to ask if you've done any contested ones. Um, I was involved, I think, in perhaps one contested that eventually resolved. Uh, we use our conciliation program in Berkshire County for those cases as well, because they can be very emotional when you have families involved. Sure. And that's a nice tool that we can use. Brothers and sisters can be mean at that time to each other. Yeah. Money. Um, I started by saying I was going to vote for you. You got that, even though I uh, got a little animated. Um, so I, you, you've done those. You've done some MCAD cases, appellate work. Do you think that probate judges, I think it's a train wreck, mostly because I think they have too much discretion. Do you, they, and there aren't enough guidelines put in place in terms of what they could do. Would you agree with that? We are given a lot of uh, a broad range of discretion. And they're, and they're upheld in, on appeal most times because they have so much discretion. I agree. Do you think that should be reined in a little bit, especially as it applies to custody and visit in parenting time and physical, physical and legal custody? I feel like in the probate and, and family court context, we need to have wide discretion because of the issues that we're dealing with. Yeah, but that's when you run into the problems of bill, a, a bill of address being filed against a sitting probate judge. It's in the it's it's been filed in the legislature. The state rep gave a statement uh, that he believed there was a basis for it to file the bill. It's a difficult balance. You think there were probe, sitting probate judges that uh, a bias against, you know, father versus a mother or a mother versus a father? I haven't seen that in my experience. Think it's out there? Uh, it, it could be. I have not viewed that in my own personal experience. I can tell you it is based on the complaints that I've gotten. Okay, uh, yeah, I think you're a great candidate. I think your parents should be extremely proud of you that you're here today. Uh, it is a great accomplishment in terms of you, not just proud of you being here today, but proud of the uh, career that you've had over the last uh, couple of decades. I'm sorry to date you on that, but um, you've, uh, you've, you've done quite a bit. You've had a, uh, a pretty diverse experience, and, and I will be voting for you next week. Councillor, Councillor Hurley. Councillor Devaney. Thank you. I have one question that I, I, I forgot to ask, and would you allow me to ask that one question? Yes, after I ask Councillor Kennedy a question. Councillor Kennedy, being from the Golden West, um, I'm not aware of who that judge was that the bill of address was filed against. Who was it, please? I'm not going to say it on the record. I I, I was going to tell the, um, it's it's a, it's it was in the newspaper. That's why I was first alerted to it. I don't read the Boston Globe, or the Herald. I don't blame um, you. <laughs> All right, tell me later. Thank you. I will. Sorry, Councilor Devaney. Go go ahead and ask your question. Thank, thank you very much, Councilor. Um, I was remiss in not asking um, what your position is on shared parenting. 
Well, when it comes to married parents, um, I believe that when they walk into the courtroom, they're on equal footing until I hear evidence to the contrary. It's a well, different standard for unmarried parents, but that's by way of statute. Well, I just want to disclose that I am a member of Women in Leadership for Shared Parenting. Um, and we have grown right out of the United States. We have people out in other countries that are members. But um, I go back to one of the first years that I was in this seat. And um, we appointed someone to the probate court. And it is one of my, I, I regret it, but you know what? You don't have a crystal ball. We don't have a crystal ball. And nominee can say anything and everything and uh, sound good. But sometimes a robe changes a person. So anyway, this was the case. There was, um, there was a husband and wife who had been divorced. The father was very loving. He lived very close to the ex-wife and they were small little children. They were toddlers and three little children. And he used to see them almost every day. And he even would go the night before Christmas and he would stay overnight. So he would be there in the morning when they got up and got their Christmas presents. So the wife decided she was going to move across the country to Oregon with the children. Okay, before I tell you the rest of the story, this was in the Boston Globe, so Mary didn't read it. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, I've got to ask you, what criteria would you use to allow a parent to take children across the country? to live permanently. So those, first of all, those are very difficult cases. Um, but I think the case law is pretty clear that if you have parents who, I, I'm not sure if you said had shared physical custody, but if that's the arrangement that they had, um, we have pretty high standards that the mother would have to show in terms of advantage test in the best interest of the children. Um, that is, again, case law that I would have to be guided by in making the decision. But I also think, given the discretion that we discussed earlier, we can look at the whole picture. Um, take uh, it's still working. Mm -hmm. The age of the children and the involvement of the father, the reasons for the move, you look at the whole picture to figure out um, whether or not this is, in fact, a real advantage to the mother and the child and whether or not it's actually in the child's best interest. Uh, the okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story now. The wife had no job there waiting. She had no family there. She didn't know one person there. She didn't have a job waiting for her. So to me, it was clear vindictiveness. And that wonderful father was divorced from his children. There would be no relationship with those children. And she gave him visitation. That should be thrown out. I hope they don't use that word. That That's a terrible word. Counselor no Manny, should, you asked for no one, one should, question. No one should visit their children. And so at the end of this, she gave the, the father rights to be on the computer from six to seven to engage with the children. You can't hug a computer. So that concerns me. And does that come up very often? Um, I hope not, that someone wants to uh, move with their children um, at such a distance that, you know, the the spouse can really never have a, um, a relationship with the children? Um, cases in which that is allowed are very few and far between. I mean, We're it has to be, I mean, to me, there has to be concrete criteria to do that. And it wasn't any, and it was in the papers, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to mention that because that's very important to me because traditionally in the past, fathers have not had equal rights when they, when they do have, um, after a divorce with children, it's changing a little bit. Um, we need to get further because if it's a good parent, no child should be deprived of two parents. 
if they're good people, you know, so I'll get off my soapbox, but that was important to me. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to ask the question. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. Uh, at this time, um, I'd like to ask a question of uh, your daughter. Uh oh. How old is she now? She is going to be 17 in a few weeks. All right. Can you come over to where your mom is? Didn't expect this. Hi there. Hi, how are you? You can take your mask off. You you live with your mom, right? Okay. So why do you think your mother will make a good probate court judge? Well, I know I look up to her like as my role as my role model. She's a very good woman. I think that's a good answer. I don't want to press you too much. You think she's fair when she has to discipline you? Yeah, I think so. All right. Thank you. You better give her a really good present for her birthday. <laughs> I don't have any questions. Um, I think you're going to do a great job. Um, I've heard a lot of positive things about your nomination from folks um, that deal with the probate court. And um, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I think you're going to be able to sleep well tonight because I think you've got the votes from what everybody said. Uh, and um, just uh, make sure you get a robe before you start your job. Thank you, Councilor Hurley. All right. Uh, at this time, I'm going to declare the meeting closed. And um, we have an assembly, I believe, at 1 o'clock. So you're free to go and grab some lunch. And uh, that concludes our meeting today. Thank you.